Lindsay Cruz. Welcome to Bay Area Independent Filmmakers, and I'm here with some really fun, exciting guests today. Um, we have Sean McCarthy and Elizabeth Mitchell joining us after their launch of Dushaholics. And I, th I know some of you out there have been involved with this production and have seen this show take off in the film festival circuit. So we have them today. And um, we're really thrilled to have you guys. I had the, I had taken a couple of days to watch Jujushaholics, and I was dying. I could not believe. I mean, I could. There was just some really great things, especially since I've taken a couple of years to try to motivate myself and understand, you know, like about personality and what's your drive and blah, 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 and what's, you know, your defaults and, and the default thinking that goes through your head. And so when I was watching, I, uh, I just, I thought that the writing was incredible. So I'm really thrilled that you two have taken the time to come and sit with us. Um, I'm really excited, especially you, Elizabeth, being a f um, female fem filmmaker here in the Bay Area. I'm, I'm really thrilled to have you. Well, thank you so much for your amazing words on <laughs> the series, and we are like so stoked to be here too. Like we love you, like off camera. So just any <laughs> any chance to get to see Rosie is like yes, we let's do it. And if we have to have like cameras around us, like listening to our convo, that's all good. So we're thank you so much for having us. Oh it's yay! Just, it's just like a trip and a pleasure to see you in general. So this is I, I'm going to indulge here, um, and I, I want to ask you about just becoming a filmmaker. Um, uh, you know, like what was your path and how you started. So I, I do remember reading that you started out really super young. Yeah. And um, created Gorilla Fil Wanderers film like at a really super young age. So you just knew your path. Yeah. Like what was, what started you to um, start that early? Uh, like, just, you know, I just, there was never a, you know, somebody has a calling for me. This was film and, and, and I know a lot of, you hear a lot of people say, yeah, there was no other, Thing for me, the things I like the most is to is to tell stories and, and make stories, and, and my favorite ways of doing that was just watching stuff in the dark, and a lot of that came from just watching stuff with my dad and watching stuff with my family, and and just going like, wow, this is the coolest job in the world. And at first, you think it's it's the actor, like you think it's Dustin Hoffman doing, you know, in Marathon Man. You go like, oh, I want to live in that world, but then you realize, oh, that's John Schlesinger directing that. That. You know, there's, I hear a lot of filmmakers talk about that moment where they realize, like, it switches from, oh, wait, I'm really in love with this world and the acting of it, and I realize I love acting, but I also realize I love the world creation behind it, too. So for me, that happened when I was a kid, and I watched, like, Pulp Fiction and, and certain films that just, like, really sparked something for me that I realized, like, oh, that's what I love. So that's what I'm responding the most to. And once I realized that when I was, like, 11 or 12, um, I just never stopped studying film and making film and the first version of Gorilla Wanderers was like a cut out a printout of like a gorilla with my, like handwriting on a black background and I was like oh this is <laughs> this is it was in high school and I made 80 short films and a feature film in high school using that one logo there and I was like oh this is funny because it's it says gorilla but it's like gorilla warfare but it's a gorilla <laughs> and I was <laughs> <laughs> but that's like where, that's where like it started from was just uh -huh. making films like that and that's really where gorilla, gorilla wander started from when I was in high school uh-huh that's really interesting. Yeah. So you re really had a vision for yeah. what you wanted to do. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's, it's some boy humor there. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. So how did you two meet? Like, um, We actually what? met on an audition. He was my very first audition ever. Um, I was going to acting school in San Francisco. And, um, and where was I'd, that? Uh, the Actor Center of San Francisco. Uh -huh. um, it was with uh, Shelley Mitchell, no relation. She's actually down in L.A. now. Um, but she studied with uh, Strasbourg um, back in New York, and then she took her, she took his class, and she basically replicated it in in the city. So I was with her for um, only a few months at that point, and I got this random MySpace message um, from some creeper saying like, "Hey, I noticed you act. Like, I'm casting for a film. Do you want to audition?" And I was like, I mean, I feel like like 99.9% .9 of women at that point would be like. Oh my God, like, no, like, rapist. But I was like, someone wants to cast me? <laughs> yes. So, I mean, yeah, I did think I was gonna, like, probably die, but I was, at the same time, I was like, audition, yeah. I didn't even have to, like, try. It just, like, came ambition. to me. <laughs> yeah. I may die, but, but <laughs> it's an audition. There's a chance for a callback. <laughs> exactly. Um, so, yeah, I, I uh, 
we met at an audition. I, uh, he was my very first audition. I read for him. I was crazy nervous. Uh -huh. um, but luckily, I when I first met him, I didn't really think like he was like all that. So I wasn't like like it would have been <laughs> terrible to be to have those like audition nerves on top of being like, oh my god, and I want to bang the director, <laughs> <laughs> like mess. So I, I held it together just enough that that I got through it. So that, that's how we met. That's awesome. Yeah. So <laughs> what, what project was this? Is, is this one of your first projects, or was this something um, uh, more recent? It was it was uh, superhero. So it was one of my professional shorts. So I'd made a bunch of shorts in high school and a feature in high school, and and those were all what I considered practice. And then I started making professional shorts and music videos and commercials. And this was along that line where I was I was doing already shooting, directing commercials and music videos. And there's a you know I want to go back to what I always want to do and love is is making original work. And so Superhero was the project that we were doing, a superhero true tale by chance. And so when we were auditioning, you know, especially when we were auditioning, then I, I like the, the regular casting areas, but I also realized I like also actors who, like her, it was her first audition, or other people who are non-actors reaching out and going like, oh, you have something interesting about you. Or So we looked through every single kind of channel that we could go through, and I still like that too now, is like exploring and seeing how far you can open up that casting net to see what kind of actors and what kind of, personalities and energy and talent you can bring it into mm -hmm. and and uh, you know something like Wes Anderson with Royal Tenenbaums he had that one actor that I forgot how they met but um, the Indian actor who's now passed away he was um, a staple of his work and he found him I think like offset he found him not at a casting call or something like uh -huh. that and I always thought like that's a cool thing when you can integrate like trained actors with other actors with non-actors all kind of coming together and so that's so when we were doing that, I said, "Oh, I want to reach out to more people." And I told my producer, I think my producer thought it was a, a fun way to like look up people on like like MySpace or you know stuff like that. So you guys are just stalking. So, yeah. So, so he was. He sent me all these, yeah. and I was like, "Oh, these aren't real actors, or these aren't real." But then I saw her, and I saw that she would trained, and I was like, "Okay, I want like something there that we want to kind of explore and see if come." And and it, it worked out, you know, because uh, you know not just as a creative collaboration as an actor director, but she's now my co-creator my producing partner so that's one of the best casting decisions ever made <laughs> <laughs> so so that evolved out. from being a part of the cast in superhero to joining the team and what was your next role with his film company like what did you decide to take on after that I'm, I'm kind of curious how you went from being an actor to then becoming this executive producer which you're you know you're now yeah. a part of um, with Dushaholics. So I just I would like to learn more about that journey for you and um, um, what motivated you to go in that direction. It was, it was a very long journey. I don't think we have like enough time to really like <laughs> get into it. Um, we can talk after, but I'll try to, I'll try to condense. Um, so basically I, we, I shot with him um, on that short and then I didn't um, kind of have any contact with him for at least like maybe like another year. And then I randomly got an email saying that he was um, shooting a new short and there was like a little part in it and did I want to be in it? And I, it was like, oh yes, like again, like yes please. Like I'm, I'm an actor and you're allowing me to, to do my thing. Like mm -hmm. yes, I'm way in. So, um, and that's a great thing. That's about like knowing your, you know, like collaborating with people you already know. That's your network. Mm -hmm. You've already that's been established, and you trust her. He, you trust him, obviously, at that point. So that that's a really great thing. So that's something to learn, you guys. That y your networks in the past will always be your your future, you know, employer or another project that would come your way. But I'm yeah. not, sorry, I just wanted to insert that. No, that that's that was like really that's really important and huge. And I think uh -huh. that we actually put a lot of that into practice. Like if you notice, like um, pretty much just a little sidetrack here, everyone in Dushaholics, like no one in that circle is anyone that we had not worked with previously at least oh. at least two or three times. Um, we're very big on like, you know, keeping that whole like family to like he referenced mm -hmm. like Wes Anderson earlier. Like he has his like crew that it's, mm -hmm. it's a Wes Anderson movie, you know who's gonna be in it. And like we kind of sort of, I mean, we always like working with new people and discovering new talents and, mm -hmm. and new collaborators and people and friends to play with. But we like we like that mentality of just kind of keeping your your base and your the people that you trust, and the, yeah. the longer you work with them, then you d just you develop this like shorthand and this trust, and it's almost mm -hmm. this like familiar like family thing that yeah. it it makes it not so much like work sometimes. But um, so okay, what were we even talking about? 
the journey. Right. So yeah. <laughs> so then, um, so I did the little part in his other short film, and then we actually started dating like a couple months later. Um, that was when we went on like our first like real date, I guess. And then um, then we got together, and he put me in a couple like music videos that he was making. But we were very separate in terms of the work. Um, I was actually working for a school at that point, um, barely working for the school because I felt like I was always calling in going like, oh no, I can't come in today when I was like, oh, I'm going to help out on set or whatever. <laughs> um, so it was really like, it, honestly, it kind of just really started as a way to hang out with my boyfriend. Like, oh, you're, you're filming today? Like, can I like PA for you? Like, oh, you just need someone to like pick up food? I can do that. Sure. And like, easy payday, hang out on set. Uh -huh. And then um, then the more I was like kind of on set, like in that capacity, just like not as an actor, I realized like, oh shit, like, I ha like I'm actually needed on a film set, you know? Whereas like when you're an actor, you're like, cool, I'll just wait here for 20 hours. And then, oh, are you guys ready? Yeah, all right. And then you're like, cool, I'm here and we're good to go. And then you know how it goes. And then it's yeah. like, hurry up and wait though. Like, oh yeah, we're about to roll. Oh no, there's a lighting issue or something that yeah. you're like, um, but at least like when you're, when you're behind the scenes, you're actually like necessary. And, and I was like, this is more fast paced and cool. And like, all right, I feel like, I feel a little more useful. Yeah. So then, um, yeah, I kind of just, uh, like forced him <laughs> to like keep bringing me on set in some capacity. And then eventually I got kind of tired of the PA thing. Cause, um, you know, I'm, I'm not like, I, I don't drink coffee. So it's really hard for me to relate to people that like live like that's the lifeblood of a set is coffee. And mm -hmm. when I'm the one responsible for coffee, I always had this thing going like, I'm sorry, guys, like, I don't know how to do this. I don't know how to help you with that. <laughs> Maybe this isn't for me. Um, so then I eventually started doing like production design and art direction because I really I, I feel like I'm like this frustrated interior designer. Like if I wasn't <laughs> if I wasn't doing this, I'd probably be like going like, hey, do you guys want to pay me to like decorate your house? And then I'd feel like fulfilled in that way. Um, and then eventually it was a case of like, oh, uh, why don't I produce too? And then he was like, like, it was more me going like, I could produce and him going like, you should produce. And like, then it was like, oh, okay, I guess I'm a producer. That's like a kick. I go, I go, go. <laughs> With everybody, I mean, Alex and Justin over here, I, you know, they all know, like, I like to push people off because you know, you, you either know you're going to fly or you're going to hit the ground yeah. and go like, oh, that didn't work out. Maybe yeah. you should consider something else. And like with her, that's a weird thing to know that like my wife uh, is essentially one of the best creative producers and one of the best, best collaborators that I didn't realize that. I didn't realize that it evolved over time organically, but you come to realize like, oh wow, when we collaborate, there's special things that happen, like how Dusha Hawks came about or like when she brought the, pro one of the music videos, she brought, she brought in the client, she brought in the project. And as I said, well, I, have, uh, I had a policy at the time of like, well, if you bring it in, um, you can produce it if you if you know if you uh -huh. wanna if you bring in the project, and so she came in and she didn't want to do it at first, but I was like, I think you know you'd be good for that, and she turned out to be, you know, a great collaborator and producer in that way. So uh -huh. and it's a weird, it's an interesting balance too because we also like I see how she's like assessing <laughs> my like, but there, there is a thing about there's an interesting balance that you have of, wow this is great because we can also talk about our work anywhere. We can talk about like when we're going on dates or we talk. We just end up talking about movies because that's what we love, movies and movie making. So, like, you know, the, the thing that we had to kind of train ourselves, and I think Dusha Alex made us better with that, is, like, how you become better collaborators. And I think mm -hmm. it also helps the relationship, too, because you have to learn, like, uh, you know, Kamal and Emily, who did the the big sick, they, they told, I asked them for advice because they worked together uh -huh. uh, and drew that, and they were saying something along the lines of, like, don't talk about it when you go to bed. Like, we have a rule. I was like, oh, that's a great rule. Let's try that. And we don't always succeed at that. But, like, we're like, all right, once we get in that bed, we don't talk about, like, work. Uh -huh. We don't talk about, uh -huh. like, specifically that. You have to get out of bed or go to another room. Uh -huh. But there's a thing that it, I think that doing this process and, and realizing organic, organically over time how we've learned to collaborate, it just made our both, I think, our relationship stronger and also us as collaborators strong, too. Uh -huh. Yeah, and I think also like the the rule about no no work talk in bed, like that's when it feels like work talk though. That's when it's a problem. But but like you said, you know, sometimes we'll like we we just had a one of the first in a long time date nights a, a few weeks ago, and we just ended up we actually came up with like another concept for a series that we uh -huh. were talking about. And like halfway through the conversation, I realized like 
oh shit, we're doing what we said we weren't gonna do tonight. We're talking about work, but it didn't feel like work. Uh -huh. So it's really when it, it feels like work, then it's a problem. But the nice thing about what we have going is most of the time it, it doesn't feel like work. It just, yeah. it, it's like it's like play with your, your partner and your best friend. So you said something interesting. You said another series. Mm -hmm. So why choose a series versus a film? Why, when you're talking about creation and creating work and yeah. fun things, you know, that that's, um, I, I, I always, I went through a couple of months in trying discussing with some um, producers uh, what to do next and choosing our you know our created I idea that you know it just kind of comes to you right why choose a a series over a film and it took us quite a long time to actually narrow it down for ourselves so you you knew it was going to be a series well so like say like Dushaholics uh, originally we thought about a short film. Um, we were gonna make Douchaholics into a short film, just the concept of like an AA meeting, but for douchebags, like centered on one character with like the rest of the group supporting. But then when we started talking about, um, you know, the actors we wanted to cast, we realized like, oh no, they should get their own episode though. Like, like I, like it was either gonna be like a 37 hour movie or we're like, <laughs> we're gonna have to turn this into like some kind of like, like period, like serials. Uh -huh. Because there was just too many douchebags that we wanted to explore and, and give like <laughs> give like a like their own thing for, um, and then for this other thing that we were talking about, it just made more sense. It's actually gonna we're hoping to it, some somewhat of a, a documentary docu series. Um, so and there were there were just too many things that we were like kind of spitballing about it. We we're like, oh yeah, we could like talk about like this person or that person, like like the theme of whatever we're gonna do. Um, I guess we just have too much like shit that we want to do. <laughs> so we're like, we can't make like, we can't make like Ben-Hur, you know? So we're like, might as well just like make a series. <laughs> and, there, and I think there's something uh, creatively calculated that you can do. There's, there's a compounding creative inter uh, interest that happens if you keep working on something. Just like we talked about building a family and a team and like, you know, like our team, there's everyone has dropped the ball, myself included and you get better and that's what building a family comes from and then working on a series it's the same thing where you that you, you know like anything you shoot the pilot and then you keep shooting more and you start realizing you start cracking the code creatively on different things and it allows you to instead of to do a short you get to do short form novella over the long course it becomes this long novel that you get to do and you get to go deeper into deeper into deeper into different things and there's multiple layers to that too and then just from like, even if you're thinking as a filmmaker too, from a, in today's day and age where people are watching stuff, everyone's binging stuff. There's a feature film that comes out and if it doesn't have a follow up or a sequel or something like that, there is an element that people, it's harder to market like from the distribution side and that. Oh. So there is a thing of being conscientious as a filmmaker of like you're building a brand essentially. You're building a brand of a show and over a course, like a long course of time, like say Dick Wolf with Law and Order, I mean, how many spin-offs and how many projects have come from that? And there's something about being able to build long-term projects versus one feature film that's shot over like, you know, eight or nine days. It's a micro mm -hmm. budget and you can't do, you know, you can't do everything you want to do. Here we could do like a four day shoot, put a lot of energy towards a 10 minute piece instead of trying to spread ourselves thin and then come back and then do another four or five days on another episode and really grind into it and really bring up the production value on that too. And then if you watch them all together, even though they're all done in these little spurts, the, com the compounding interest, the longer version of it, it becomes this longer uh, movie basically. And the production value is like higher because we got to use things in spurts. We got to grab people over the weekend. We got to have actors who may, may not take on a whole series, but they want that one showpiece episode and then they can they can devote that amount of concentrated time towards it too. And then also the show's designed too so that it constantly has a life beyond it too because it has you know if you've seen from the first season, the actors on this particular show can come and go a lot of times. So there's a musical chair to people coming in doing a great performance, and then they can leave. And then maybe later on when they they say hey want to come back they can come back you know something like that. So each each show there is something to building that over time and building a presence towards the show. Same with the other docu-series that we were uh, brainstorming. There's something to building that over time because there's many things that you can explore. And mm -hmm. for people to watch stuff too, you know, there's so many three hour movies or two hour movies that people haven't heard of that are being made today, but shows, there's something that can just continue on in people's minds and then they get excited for like a year from now, the next season to come out. Or somebody, I can imagine some 15 year old discovering this like 10 years from now 
and maybe we're on season three or season <laughs> four, and then that kid starts laughing, and it's the first time they ever saw the D Cup episode or something like that. So <laughs> there's that cool thing of laying it out there and allowing it to just kind of ferment and audiences to take it as their own thing. And grow, too. Yeah. I mean, like, when you make a film, like, you're done with your film, and then, like, there you go. Like, that's it. Um, at least with... I mean, some of my favorite shows, actually, sometimes when I... Like catch like a rerun or like Netflix like like the earlier seasons. I go like, oh, this show kind of sucks. Like, how did how did I how, why was I so obsessed with this? And then I go like, oh, because once you get to like season like three or four, when they find their groove, when the characters really develop, and you know when when they first start writing for a certain character and they're not really sure, and then the actor comes in and kind of makes it their own, and then they they start writing to their strengths, and then I think like you know after a while like some long term series find their groove and they go like, oh, okay, this this makes, this makes works, whereas maybe like the first like few episodes don't necessarily, because you can keep growing, whereas yeah. like a film, you're like, okay, you're done, and unless you go back and remake it, which I know yeah. like people do all the time, but, <laughs> um, you know, and even even like with a play where you, it's the same thing every night, but the actors have a chance to, to go like, well, I want to try something new, like tomorrow night or like in the moment, you know, during the matinee that didn't go well, so... During the, the 7 o'clock showing tonight, I'll, I'll make that work. Um, so yeah. that's exciting to us, too, to just be able to keep to growing and, uh -huh. and nurturing it. And uh -huh. there's a beauty to doing both, doing a feature film and doing a, this episodic type thing. And it's cool. It's like we can leave this alone for a while if we want to, and then we can pick it up a year or two from now and pick up on the show and see where the characters have been, gone and been or introduce new characters. Or if we do a feature film in between, Maybe there's an actor we discover through that process where we're like, hey, do you want to do an episode of this thing? And this is only like a three-day commitment type thing. So uh -huh. there's, there, there's that fun of doing different things at different lengths. Uh -huh. and, but th there was a reasoning behind that because I think we're at this point in, in, in the world and the way people consume media and people watch and storytelling is we always like to watch things in the dark. It's, it's part of our DNA of watching our cavemen ancestors, you know, <laughs> cave women telling stories by the fireside. And it hasn't changed. It just happens to be a laptop and an iPad and, and iPhones and things like that. People watch stuff, and you're able to now in this landscape discover things in the ways that you couldn't before. People in Canada or in, in the U.K. could just click on a button on iTunes and Amazon and just discover the show if they want to. And it's not – there's no, like – the gatekeepers aren't real, don't really exist like they used to. So uh -huh. it opened up I a agree. whole thing where we can, we can now make our own stuff, and now we can get it out there, and we can do it from anywhere in the world, and that's so cool, you know. So yeah. to to just be able to do that, to have that freedom, where not just the tools are democratized, but the systems of distributing it and sharing it are democratized. I mean, I think that's what feels fun. It feels like we're at this new frontier where we're charging forward and asking questions that a lot of people are like, oh wait, I haven't thought of that, or like. Everyone's still discovering this landscape, so it's opening up. The technology is allowing shifts to open, and we're allowing it's allowing culture to change with these shifts. So the fact that we get to do something like this, where it's a different lengths, different different lengths for each episode, and the different styles of the episode, and ways to get it out there for people to discover, and even make it transmedia, where there's a graphic novel, there's episodes, there's you know there could be stuff, little stories told on Instagram that uh -huh. people could catch little details in the show too. All that stuff is, is fun and we get, you get to play on a larger landscape. What's your, what was your biggest challenge like overall as producers of this particular show? And I'm I just, keep... I just, I saw him do like the five minute thing, and you ask a question like that. Okay, in two sentences. One uh, each. Okay. What was your biggest challenge as a producer and how about you as the director? Okay. Do you want to go first, or? Uh, I mean, I would have to pick just one. <laughs> um, <laughs> what stands out? Like, what's, like, that, that feeling that just, ugh. I mean, honestly, like, selfishly, I would say having to also act in it as well, because when I'm in producer mode, I'm in producer mode, which is completely in my head, and for an actor, being in your head is the worst place you could possibly yeah. be. So I think that was, for me, probably, I mean, there were, oh, so many, like, Oh, so many. But if I had to just narrow down <laughs> one, I would say probably having to um, to balance the producer and the actor like relationship on set when I'm, you know, I'm I'm needed in the shot because I have one line to deliver and the continuity, blah blah. blah. Like I cannot leave this chair. Yet at the same time, I need to make sure that like lunch is going to be here on time. Like, oh, there's some <gasps> actor that's having some like diva meltdown. Like I 
kind of want to go deal with that, but then at the same time, <laughs> kind of, love it. Happy I'm in the chair, and I can't. We're gonna be um, best friends. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I love yeah. it. So I would <laughs> probably that. <laughs> How about you um, as a director? What was your biggest challenge? I mean, the, the fun part to me was building a world out and going and, and knowing that one moment in episode two affects episode six, like things like that. That was a fun, and it was a fun challenge. The the part I'd say was like tougher or frustrating was just the logistical thing of we would we made a decision early on to do this style where we'd shoot the meetings first and gain momentum on the meetings, take a pause, kind of like Castaway Tom Hanks style, where nobody mm -hmm. lost weight, but we'd work on the cut to make sure that we we had the best takes. And then we'd do the flashbacks, kind of like drunk history, music uh -huh. video style, where we'd play back the best takes, and the actors would have to perform their own takes previously, and the other actors would have to adapt like the way the flashbacks were, uh -huh. because somebody tells a story, and it's all from their perspective. So it was just... That taking that pause and then the logistical nightmare of getting all these people back together six months later, uh -huh. one year later, whenever they were, like, that was the thing is their schedules kept shifting. Everyone would be, now they're in LA or they're in New York and now it's like, well, we need you to come back. And then now like like the girls in the tween episode, like like month by month was going on. I was like, oh my gosh, these are 12 year old girls, like they're not gonna <laughs> look like it's a flashback. Like things like that, that were just logistical nightmares, uh -huh. but we were doing it for creative reasons and it just, you know, those things always rub up against each other. So uh -huh. that was, I think that was one of the most challenging things. Uh, awesome. So um, that is amazing. Thank you so much. I have a, one more question for the both of you. Um, <laughs> if you go back in time, talk to your 23-year-old self at a crossroads in this and deciding what to do next, what would you tell yourself, what you know now to yourself then? Um, probably just like cool out, bitch. It's gonna work out. <laughs> It'll be okay. Like just, just, just trust. Just trust. Just trust. Because I mean, you know, wherever wherever you end up, it's you're you're meant to be there. And I think like, um, I mean, it's not like I have everything figured out. You know, I'm sure like me ten years from now will be like, oh look at you thinking like you're all like slick talking to your 23 year old stuff. Let me let you know some things. <laughs> But I think, um, you know, especially when you're you're that age, you're just like, what is this world that I'm suddenly thrust into? And you still feel like you need being taken care of, but at the same time, you're like, I'm an independent woman, and like, God, just just relax, pause, cool out, trust that it's all going to be okay. Got it. That's great advice. How about you? Um, there's a book I've been reading, and it's called The Obstacles the Way. And I, if I had taken that more into consideration earlier on by like just like almost like taking the thrill of solving the problem and dealing with like success and failure is just an obstacle uh -huh. and just navigating that a little bit more like that, that that's the only thing I would tell the 23 year old version of me uh, which would technically be two years older because I'm only 21, but <laughs> but I, I would. I so would, you're talking yeah, to I'm your talking future, future self. self. I'm telling future <laughs> self. But I, uh, there, I think there there would just be that is just take the thrill because if you approach everything because no matter what, if you're on a film set and if you're a filmmaker, you're accepting a world of chaos because you're trying you're do, trying to do the unimaginable and it's really hard to capture magic in a bottle. If you're, it's not just a hobby type thing where you're just, oh, I'm happy to be shooting. Like if you're trying to shoot and you're trying to go for the gold and really make something that you're passionate about and something that you hold yourself to a high level of standard to, it's, you're gonna encounter problems. You're gonna mm -hmm. encounter conflicts. You're gonna encounter things. And if you look at it as like, well, what's the end goal? And let me just have fun with solving these problems. Then you can take the emotions out of the mix. You can take, you know, it's hard because you're expressing emotions yeah. and discovering that but you also have to have that clarity of like, well, this is just, it's not going to stop. There's never been a set where like, I mean, you know that, right? It's yeah. Like anything, like <laughs> moment when somebody says like, oh, it's going to be easy. That's when it's not going to be easy. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, like yeah. The, knowing the obstacle is the way, just knowing to have fun with it and just know that like once you're doing a project is the gun has gone off and you're running down the track and whatever obstacle gets thrown at you, just have fun with it. Do it with a smile and just, you know, move forward. Awesome. Mm -hmm. yeah. Can you tell our audience like, uh, where they could find Dusha Holix oh, yes. um, and um, yes. your social media handles yes. also to follow you guys. Okay. Yeah. Um, we are at uh, dushaholix.com, D O U C H E, everyone forgets the E, A H O L I C S.com. 
Um, you can find out more about us at the Dushaholics.com website. We also have a Instagram that's Dushaholics, uh, Facebook that's uh, Dushaholics, and uh, Gorilla Wanderers Films to uh, Facebook and a website called GorillaWanders.com. Um, and then my personal handle, I guess, is G underscore Wanderer uh, on Instagram. Are we doing that too? Yes. Oh, right yes. on. Lizzie right. Popeye, L A Z Z I E, not L A Z Z Y. <laughs> Pot, like, you know, and then pie. <laughs> That's awesome. That's easy to remember, right? Well, thank you so much. And um, you, yeah, Lizzie. become an official douche. Um, follow them and yeah. come watch. And we're going to leave you with the 30 second trailer so you can get a sample of what this is. Bye. Well, it's, it's hard to say. Yeah. Take it day by day. You want to talk about it? Temptation's always there. Some people have to get in my way. I have to mow them down. Sometimes I can fight. Other times I can't. Yo, bro. You forgot protocol. Oh, yeah. Right. Yo, uh, my name's Tony, AKA Teabag, AKA Tenacious Pex. Would you like to share? I have a brilliant tale for you all. My life is embarrassingly normal. I am the happily married mother of three. AKA T Esticular Fortitude. What's your problem? So I'm woozy, okay? It's Monday afternoon, I'm at the bar and grill getting my drink one. AKA T Berculosis. Everyone's <laughs> laughing at me, ha ha ha. We're all laughing at Ted, having a good time. I don't believe any of this. Believe it, sister! We were besties. Now we're not. That's because you said I was a little bitch. Look, I don't know if you read the flyer or not, but all of us, we came here tonight so that we could talk and share and confess. It's a support group for people who exhibit poor behavior and they're trying to better themselves. It's not worth what gets to me! Don't you do it, bro! No! I'm just being real, be real. I can't help it. A bird's gonna fly, a fish is gonna swim. We are what we are. AKA ABC, P-U-R-S-T, U-V-X-Y-Z, um, and I guess I'm a douche.